Hey, what is up? Welcome to this episode of the Entrepreneur to Entrepreneur podcast. As always, I'm your host, Brian Lofermento, and I'll tell you what, a lot of you listeners know that my one word for 2024 is building for so many different reasons, and that's why I am particularly excited about today's guest because this is an entrepreneur who, at her heart, she is a builder, and you're gonna see how that manifests in her work, in her attitude towards helping not only her own growth, but helping other businesses grow, I'm super excited for all of us to learn from her. So let me tell you about today's guest. Her name is Tiff Quillen. Tiff is the owner of Nova Marketing, a marketing agency that serves the architecture, engineering, and construction industries. You see building popping up right there, right away. She spent six years directing marketing strategies for agencies and tech companies with billion dollar valuations while simultaneously undertaking freelance projects. Deciding to invest her weekends and evenings into establishing her own brand, she focused on her business during her free time. Within just eight weeks, she was able to resign from her corporate job and fully commit to her venture, which I think is just an incredible example of her ability to build things, not only for and with her clients, but especially from a business perspective. I know so many of you listeners can relate to Tiff's journey from going from entrepreneur to entrepreneur. I'm so excited about this one. I'm not going to say anything else. Let's dive straight into my interview with Tiff Quillen. All right, Tiff, I am so excited that you're here with us today. First things first, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. Glad to be here. Heck yeah. Listeners can't see. You and I can see each other, but listeners can't see. You've got a sweet Nova neon sign in your background. I'm a sucker for neon signs, so super pumped for your aesthetics as well, representing your brand. But before we start start talking about your brand, take us beyond the bio. Who's Tiff? How'd you start doing all these cool things? Absolutely. I'd love to. Um, So I've been in marketing for 10 years now, and I've worked a little bit everywhere. Um, But I think for a long time, I was unhappy with with my jobs. I would come home, I was doing great at work, but I never really enjoyed what I was doing. And my husband would always remind me, you'd be happier if you started your own business. And I think that's easy for people who want to be entrepreneurs to remind themselves of, but it's harder to act upon. And then I was at a picnic one day, I was kind of complaining about my job. And somebody said, why don't you have enough experience to do this on your own? And it was kind of a little push for me. I kind of was like, yeah, why am I not doing this on my own? And it, it, it really lit a fire under me to to start and focus on myself and build my own business. And um, now I'm in a place where I'm, I'm so excited to be helping other entrepreneurs build their own businesses um, and, and take that leap as well. Yes, I love that, especially because listeners won't know this tip, but you and I know it. We've had to reschedule a few times because you're so busy with work, which I absolutely love that for you. And I think it's such a shining example of the fact that you are deeply serving people and you're very proactively invested in their growth, which in turn means you grow as well. But I want you to take us into your industry because we're going to talk a lot about marketing here today. But the fact that you found that nice corner of the world within the architecture, engineering and construction industry, how that come about? Oh, it's so interesting. I think with most things, you kind of just fall into it. And the client I had kind of as a freelance client for a long time was in the engineering industry. And I thought, well, what's related to engineering that I could kind of build off of and specialize in? And I was doing some research and it it seemed like architects, engineers and construction people work together all the time. It is kind of this AEC industry. And I just did a little bit of research and there wasn't a lot of competition. So I thought, let's give it a try. It was really more of a test and I, I set it up and it worked. So I, I was like, let's go full in on the AEC industry. Yeah. Um, and I love you talking about the fact that there's not much competition because here's the thing, Tiff, as someone who gets to talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, I always hear this obstacle or objection that people are like, yeah, but my business is different. My industry is different. And it's really cool to me because you have a background in marketing and you're applying it to I don't know, people might view your industry as traditional, as something that is set in its ways. It's obviously been around for hundreds of years, quite literally, but still, marketing is fundamental to all businesses. So talk to us about applying your marketing background to this industry in particular. Yeah, one thing that is super interesting, you're correct that the AEC industry is an older industry. I mean, I think a lot of times, like when we're building businesses, we think we have to start with a new idea, but the truth is, 
there's all these people that aren't being served and, and maybe they do have kind of split traditional and, and more, um, more relevant, more digital needs, but somebody needs to be served there. So if it, it doesn't matter how old a business is, there's opportunity there if you just look. Yeah, really well said. And and I think that's true, not just with businesses, not just with industries, but with customers and client bases. If we pick anybody, it's all about figuring out those needs. And so I'd love to get your insights into the industry. You're so uniquely positioned in what you do because you do bring the marketing hat to it, which we've had some architects here on the show and they have been instrumental into the way that I personally think. I know listeners have really enjo- enjoyed those episodes, but Tiff, they're builders, quite literally, not in the sense that you and I are talking about building businesses, but they are literally builders. They're very project oriented. They are amazing with blueprints and pen in hand, but they don't necessarily focus on the business side of it. They're not as excited about marketing as we may be. So talk to us about working in that environment. Yeah, so I think at at a space need, the AC industry really needs um, two different types of marketing. And the first is kind of like lead gen services to get business in the door, which that's the more modern type of marketing. But the second type of marketing is traditional. It's more brand related. And I think like the number one thing that I've learned from the AEC industry, and I think this applies to every company, right? This applies to everyone who wants to start their own business and for any type of business in any industry that's trying to take the next step in their business is learning to say less through branding. So in any business, um, people are going to form opinions about you in two ways. The first is they're going to form opinions about you in those external resources they see, right? What does your online presence look like? What does your website look like? What do your reviews look like? But they're also going to form an opinion based on the conversation you have with them. So those are your top two opportunities in any business to make your case for here's why you should buy my service or here's why you should buy my product. And we as business owners, as want to be business owners, we have the tendency to discount ourselves, not only verbally, but we do this visually as well. And what this looks like verbally is we qualify our statements. So a good example of this would be like, you're doing a presentation in school, you start out that presentation with, hey, I only had an hour to do this and one of my sources isn't so great, but I'm gonna go ahead and give you this presentation anyways. Well, right away, you've told your audience not to trust you. And that's an example of verbally how we like to discount ourselves. Visually, we do the same things. Um, A good example of this would be maybe you're starting a new business and you build a website. And on that website, you have a section that says, oh, here's all of the work we've done. And somebody goes to that page and there's just one example. Well, right away, you've given that audience a reason not to trust you. Oh, they're just starting out. I don't know if they would be reliable. And really within the AEC space, what we do is help clients say less. So we make sure that they're not coming to the table qualifying themselves and they're not supplying information that is going to discredit them before they've had a chance to have a conversation with somebody. Whoa, Tiff, that's important stuff there. We don't always hear people talk about saying less, especially the fact that you've differentiated differentiated these two important arms of marketing about we need to figure out what the heck we're going to say and how our brand shows up in the world and then apply the digital stuff that everybody loves to talk about, which we will inevitably talk about in today's episode. But I really want to go deeper into that first part of saying less because where my head goes is, well, if we say less then what we say holds even more importance and even more weight. I remember when I was 19 and I started my first business, I thought, let me just throw a bunch of words at the at the wall and something will resonate with the ad advertisers that I'm talking to. And so to your point, that was doing myself a disservice because I wasn't cutting through to the heart of what I stood for and what I was doing and the value that I could provide. And also it was probably a very muddied (laughs) message that I was putting out there. So Tiff, how do we find those right things to say if we're saying less? I think you really just need to focus on what you do and try to remove qualifying qualifying statements. So um, a really good example of this is, you know, on my website, when I first set it up to focus on the AEC industry, I only had one client example in that industry. So on the website, I didn't have a whole section that said, oh, here's all of the work we've done and all of our clients, because it would have made me look abysmal. Instead, I have a service page saying, here's what we do. 
but here's who we serve. And then I have just one example of success. Besides that, on my website, I don't even have testimonials from clients. I have none of that. And what's really interesting is I haven't had any complaints or objections about that. And I've actually had people when they have their first conversations with me say, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because your website doesn't look spammy. You don't have 1400 reviews on your website, which feels inauthentic. And it feels like you're trying to make up for the fact that maybe you don't provide good service. So you're right in thinking that when we say less, it allows people to get to the point we're trying to make better, faster, and it can even make us look like a higher end, more authentic brand. Yeah, I think that's really powerful, especially when we think about the brands that we all know, like the tip of our fingers, Nike comes to mind. Just do it. We can all rattle off so many of these huge brands that are super memorable and super impactful because they're simple, because they don't say so much. And so I really value yeah. it's it's a quote that I bring up quite quite often in entrepreneurial conversations it's from Abraham Lincoln, where he says, if you want me to give a five hour speech, I'm ready to go right now. If you want me to give a five minute speech, I'll need five hours to prepare. And it's so important. <laughs> So Tiff, knowing that you work with these companies in the AEC industry who don't have the same marketing background that you have, what sort of questions do you ask them? What are those prompts to get that good stuff out of them so that you can help them say less? Yeah, I think the first thing we want to do is really focus on what they provide. So really understanding what what is your value proposition? What makes you unique? Are you unique because you provide very personalized services because you are one on one on all those projects? Are you unique because you only do high end renovations that you're providing a different level of service? That's the first thing we need to understand is at, at the very base, what separates you from your competition and what truly are you hoping to sell? If we can understand that, then we look at the resources you have available to you and how we're going to leverage them. So let's say, okay, your value proposition is you're a small firm. You provide extremely authentic, timely one-on-one service. What do you currently have in your toolbox that can represent it? Do you have a past client example we can use? Do you have some photos of, of your work that we can use? And if you don't have any of those things, we just find a different way to represent your value, right? If you don't have a past project example, well, obviously we're not gonna use projects on your website. We're gonna find photos of things that represent what you want to provide. And we're gonna talk about you providing those high end services. And then we're not gonna reference that the photos aren't yours. We're not gonna claim they are either. So it's all about identifying your difference identifying if you have any examples that can support that. And if you don't, finding alternative ways of representing that and communicating that. Yeah, Tiff, it's really important stuff for all of us. And that's why I've been so excited to have you here on the show, because all this stuff we're talking about in your industry is directly relevant to every single business on planet Earth. There are zero exceptions. So listeners, if you're sitting there thinking, well, no, my business is different. You guys don't understand. No, we do, because these are the fundamentals of marketing and where you apply it to. Your funnel looks different. Your media channels may look different. There's different places that your ideal customers are, but the fundamentals remain true. The very reason why they are fundamentals. And so, Tiff, with that in mind, I do want to talk about what we do with these fundamentals. And in your case, I know that obviously there's a lot of different top of funnel strategies that we could focus on. I know that you're big on SEO and PPC in particular. Talk to us about the different channels that you operate within and how you've really arrived at those as the skill sets that can move these businesses and your clients forward. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll start by saying, um, you know, what I'm going to discuss here is is most relevant for B2C uh, businesses. A lot of B2B businesses, you might not necessarily get the business you're looking for with uh, SEO and PPC, but there are parts that are relevant. Um, so when we're talking about B2C marketing, um, you know, SEO and paid advertising is really the practice of showing up on Google. And the reason why we recommend that for our clients is because it's bottom of funnel intent, right? When we think about where people are in their purchasing journeys, if you are on Google searching for a service, you have bottom of funnel intent. You're ready for that service. You're ready to convert into a customer. And so that is the most effective, efficient use of your money if you have a limited marketing budget. That's capturing demand. 
Now, of course, there's other strategies. There's top of funnel strategies, right? We can run ads on social, we can run display ads, we can run video ads. And even though we're targeting audiences that we hope are interested in your service by demographic psychographics, we can't guarantee that they're actively in a searching phase. And so while it is beneficial to spend money there, if you have money, it's not going to lead necessarily to capturing that bottom of funnel intent. So when we're, you know, we work with a lot of small businesses or businesses launching or businesses that are trying to make the leap from, from one product to another, and they have smaller marketing budgets and the most efficient use of your money is going to be search engine optimization and paid advertising. Yeah, Tiff, gosh, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do a huge favor for listeners here because you're talking about some really brilliant marketing strategy here about meeting people where they are at that bottom of the funnel when they have that intent. And it's something that years ago we used to talk a lot about interest based advertising because everyone thinks Facebook paid per click ads. They think that that's super attractive and it's it makes for a great topic to listen to in a podcast episode or in a YouTube video. But there are important considerations from a business owner perspective. Perspective. And I see so many people who say Facebook ads don't work and they've wasted money there. And it's because they're just targeting people who have certain interests and maybe they educated them up front at the top of the funnel, but they missed out on that sale when that person eventually bought. So Tiff, take us into that strategic mind here. What does that mean? Walk us through what is the bottom of the funnel? What do you mean when it comes to that intent and how you capitalize on it? I'd love to hear more about that approach. Yeah, absolutely. So buyers, anyone when they're buying a product or service, they kind of go through this journey. Um, And this is going to start off with kind of initial understanding of that product or service, maybe progress into, hey, I might be interested in it. And then I'm going to research it. And okay, I'm actually, here's kind of my short list of who I want that product or service from. And then finally, I'm going to purchase it. And so when we're talking about top of funnel and bottom of funnel advertising, bottom of funnel is reaching people when they are actively in that buying phase. They've already identified that they want it. They've already identified that um, here's what it's going to involve. They've already identified here's my short list of people I'm interested in. So when you reach them right there, you don't have to take them through that entire journey, right? You just take them from the end of the journey through to purchasing with you, which is the best part. When you're talking about top of funnel advertising, so like advertising on Facebook, you might be catching somebody when they don't even know what the product is yet, or when they're not even sure that they want that product. And so when you reach them there, you have to be with them for that whole journey. And so it's much more work to convert those people into customers. Now, you might be able to get people at the top of funnel for a lower cost per lead. They they might be cheaper leads, which is why a lot of people say, oh, I want to do Facebook ads. I've heard it's really cheap cost per lead. But then you have to be with them for that whole journey versus if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you're a business owner, you're busy. You probably don't have time to hold their hand the whole way. If you just meet them here, you might spend a little bit more, but that cost is going to pay back dividends in the time you get back. Yeah, really well said, Tiff. I feel like you're taking a really complex topic and making it so simple for listeners to digest, especially if they don't come from the marketing world, especially if they don't understand top of funnel, bottom of funnel advertising. We're talking about dollars that we are spending and investing into our own businesses. We want to get maximum ROI from it. You're making it really simple for them to understand it. I think a simplistic example is about a week ago, I saw ads on Facebook from Lacoste about shoes. And I was like, dang, I kind of do need new shoes. I I don't buy many things and you know I stopped thinking about Lacoste shoes then by the time I went to Google and search for where I can buy shoes around me in the city that I'm in whoever won that race is where ultimately (laughs) got my dollars and I think that that's such a key thing which leads me to we're talking about some really strategic marketing here and I think nothing's more strategic than SEO because that is a long-term play that reaps huge dividends when you can own that space if I can rank number one on Google for shoes near me I'm going going to make a lot of money, but it's not obviously easy to do that. Talk to us about SEO, Tiff, because I feel like there's this growing trend and it has been there since I'm going to shout out at least 2010 where people say SEO is dead. Why is SEO fully alive and well? SEO is not dead. And no matter what people say, even with AI, it's not going to go away. It's just going to be in a different form. And the reason for is Google is a a service. It's a whole business. And you know, Google is a multi-billion dollar corporation. They are not just going to let their business disappear overnight. And the entirety of Google is based upon you wanting to go to Google 
and Google things because you get relevant information. That's how they make their money by sending you advertisements on their platform. And that quality content has to be created by somebody, right? If, if Google's making its money because you're going to Google to Google, somebody has to create that quality content at the end of the day. AI cannot create that quality content because AI just takes what's already there and regurgitates it in a different way. So if you write an article with AI, you're not adding something new or valuable to the ecosystem. You're regurgitating what's already there. So SEO is never going to go away because SEO is, is at its very core, the process of creating authentic quality content that answers somebody's question or answers somebody's need. And businesses leverage that to make sure that when that question happens, their listing is the one that shows up at the top of Google. So that's, it's never going away. It's not dead. It's just going to evolve. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's so key. I, as someone who I love email marketing and I've heard again since 2010, email marketing is dead. All these changes that ESPs are making to the way emails go to the inbox or the promotions tab, it's changed, it's evolved, but we've adapted with it. So really well said about SEO. I'm going to call this out because I think that it's such a brilliant and strategic approach that you have with your clients is that marketing blend of PPC, which is we can start a campaign today and start being ranked literally today today, minutes from now. And I think that's super powerful, but blending that with the longer term of SEO, because with PPC, if I stop paying for ads today, nobody sees my ads tomorrow. And if with SEO, if I invest in SEO today, then people will see it there. Even when I've stopped my SEO efforts, which obviously you don't want to do talk to us about that blend, because a lot of people shy away from the fact that SEO takes a long time. But why is it that that's the way that you structure your projects with clients? 100%. Well, um, first off, when we get a new client, we know that that client wants leads. Um, if they're a, a B2C service company, we know they want leads. Um, and we know that SEO really takes, well, we can show results in three months, but really month six is when we're going to start to see some pretty good rankings. Most companies can't pay for marketing for six months and not see any returns, right? So just doing SEO alone is out of the question because they would be burning cash. That's not an efficient use of their money. So what we do is we start working on their SEO right away, but we also get up pay-per-click advertising right away. And pay-per-click advertising, there is a learning period. So there's three weeks after you launch your ads where you shouldn't expect magic. Google kind of has to eat your money. But after those three weeks, you should for sure be seeing leads come in through Google cost per click. And what that does is even though you're paying for those leads, it's enough to support your business so you're getting that increase that you need to pay for the marketing, to pay for the SEO, right? And then when you get to a point where the SEO starts working and you're ranking organically for those terms that you've been paying for, then we start to decide, do we pull back on the paid advertising or do you want to kind of experience that hockey stick growth where both SEO and PPC is working for you and you can get into a, a scale phase for your business? Um, so, or do you want to take that money, you know, now that you're ranking organically for that service and reinvest it in a different service line that you're trying to grow? So it's really all about getting you leads right away and then managing your advertising in a way that's responsible for your business with the rate that you want to grow at. Yeah, Tiff, I'll tell you what, I really appreciate your transparency here because it's so clear to see the roadmap that you bring to clients. Obviously, we're using so many building analogies here today because it is my word of the year. But I really appreciate your approach with that because it is that that careful blend. And, and actually, careful is not the word I want to use there. I want to use intentional. It just seems like so much of it is intentional out of the gates for you. And it really is balanced hearing you talk about that. Part of it is when I look for the the similarities between both of those approaches, obviously keywords are at the root of so much of it. If, if I'm gonna launch a pay-per-click advertising campaign, I have to determine when people are searching for what do I want to show up? And then hearing you align that with your SEO efforts to either tamper down your ad spending or ramp it up so that you're, you said the hockey stick growth curve, how do you go about your keyword research? And I know that we, you could probably give an entire masterclass on keywords and SEO and all the elements that go behind it, but let's talk keywords for listeners who have never gone down that path. 
Oh, this is one of my favorite topics and it's where we start with each client. So we make a keyword times local matrix. And what that really is, is it's a combination of all of your services and your service areas. So for example, maybe your spreadsheet says kitchen, bath, um, uh, basement, and the services you're providing are remodeling, renovation, and your service area is Ohio. Then what we do is we actually take every combination of those terms. So like kitchen remodeling Ohio, bathroom remodeling Ohio. And we use that as the basis for keyword research to find out in your area what people are searching for, the volume, so how many people are searching for that, and then the difficulty of that, right? Is it is it really easy to, to rank for that term or is it hard to rank for that term? And based on that, we'll have a pretty good idea of for each of kind of your service buckets, what is going to be hard for you to do organically versus what's going to be easier for you to do organically and the cost of you to pay for those. And that really helps us kind of decide with the client, how should we prioritize what you're going after here? Um, and really this, this not only takes into account like the difficulty of those terms or how much you're going to pay for it, but how much do you profit off each of those services? So when we're setting up our ad groups, we do it in a way that your services are bucketed so that at the end of the day, we can calculate back your cost per lead, but also your return on ad spend, right? A, a lead for kitchen renovations might be three times as expensive as a lead for bathroom renovations, but maybe you make five times as much. And so it, it justifies that cost. So really starting out with your service buckets or your product buckets, and then aligning your campaigns that way is really helpful to have that kind of like conscientious cost control to make sure you're spending your dollars the most in the most efficient manner. Yeah, Tiff, I think that just showcases why it's so valuable to work with an expert like you. You just showed us so many different variables that you're balancing all at the same time. Cost, the ability to rank within certain regards, the the volume that is within each of those, the business considerations layered on top of all of these considerations that drive the decision making. And obviously there's an entire back end that we haven't even touched on today about measuring success and tracking those leads and attribution tracking. All of that is super important. I know we're not going to have time today to cover all of that, but I do want to transition to talk to you entrepreneur to entrepreneur, not just as the marketing expert that you are, but I love your entrepreneurial journey from a side hustle to going full time and having a full client of roster or a full roster of clients. Talk to us about that because for a lot of people, you said it, your husband was telling you, people that you were seeing at picnics were telling you to start your own business. What was that transition period actually like for you when you finally decided to to, to take the dive and start your business? You know, it was a little, <laughs> I think there was just a moment I had like a hard week at work and I was just like, okay, I'm just going to spend one day on the weekend, just changing my site a little bit. Let's narrow down my focus. Let's, let's try and focus on AEC. Let's refine things a little bit. And then let's put some ads up as a test. And after I got out of kind of that three week learning period with Google, I, I started getting leads. And the first couple that came in, I was like, okay, cool. Like, it's a little bit weird when you're in marketing, you know, these things work, but to apply it to your own business feels, you're like, ah, this will never work. The leads started coming in and it was those first few calls where I was like, oh, I might have something here. And it, it happened so quickly that it felt like a mad dash to like put together a finance sheet and say, wait, could this actually work? Can I actually quit my job? Um, and then even speaking with my husband, I showed him the finance sheet. I was like, we're actually going to be fine. Like, even if I didn't get another client for a year financially, we'd be, we'd be fine. Um, so it was kind of like a journey of <laughs> not believing. And then finally being like, oh, this could work. And I think, I think for anyone that has been saying, oh, I, I, I could be an entrepreneur. I could be an entrepreneur. It's, I forgot who said, who says it, but there's this, this idea of like, do now ask questions later, like do now plan later, right? Like throw something out and, and just see, see if you can get a little bit of traction and then ride that, that tailwind. Because if you don't ever put out that one test, if you don't ever start, you're, you're still never going to get anywhere. So just take a chance. 
Yeah, and you used the tailwind term right there, which reminds me, my favorite Amelia Earhart quote ever is she said, always think with your stick forward. If you're flying, you just have to keep on accelerating and figuring it all out along the way, which is part of the nature of being an entrepreneur, which Tiff, it leads me to, I wanna ask you this because obviously you love marketing. That is so evident here in today's session. And, and I also know that as business owners, as entrepreneurs, we're not just practitioners. You don't just get to do marketing these days. You are also a business owner, you're managing those client relationships. You are managing the accounting, the financial outlook of your business. There's so much operationally that goes on behind the scenes. So talk to us about your take on that side of the world. Um, you know, I, I enjoy it because I'm a very big like planner, but I will say the one thing that surprised me so much is how difficult it is as a small business to secure top tier health benefits, top tier 401k. Like I thought it was just going to be, I'm going to go to Google. I'm going to be like, I need health insurance. I'm going to hire my first employee. Bam. Like it would be done. No, it's like, if you're a small business, you have to jump through hoops to get like PPO insurance or provide really good coverage. And so that's one of the things that surprised me most that I would say, get a head start on that. If you're trying to scale and you want to hire is making sure you're you're securing things so that you can bring in top talent with those benefits. Yes, absolutely true. I don't think, I'm actually gonna take this way beyond entrepreneurship. I don't think societally we talk about this stuff enough, how difficult it is for small business owners. So we're definitely preaching to the choir here, Tiff, and I so appreciate that. But I think it is an important conversation and consideration for all of us, especially you and I have the luxury of being full-time entrepreneurs, but it presents these challenges that we must address. So I love the fact that you're bringing that into the conversation. I wanna ask you about, the time horizon that you look at, because I do view you, I said at the top of this episode about you being a builder at heart. It shows in the types of clients that you enjoy working with. And I actually think even more so, it really shows in your approach, the strategy that you use for your own business as well as clients. What's the time horizon that you're looking out to? Because you've mentioned AI and the world is always changing, especially in your industry. What is it that you're looking towards? What is it that you're planning towards when you think about the future? Um, so for time horizon, like a lot of our clients are on annual commitments, so we can think pretty far out because we have uh, deals secured. But to be honest, from a business scaling perspective, it's more of a three month time horizon, um, just because kind of the nature of, of the rate at which we're growing at. So we'll typically know, okay, in the next three months, you know, we've reached our capacity, so we'll have to hire again. So from a financial planning perspective, a year, but definitely from a, are we going to actually act on those plans? Closer to three months. Yes. I'm so glad that you shared that with us because Tiff, when I was sitting in business school classrooms back when I was in college, a lot of professors talked to you about having your three, five, 10 year plan. And the more that I ask this question here on the show, it, it always comes back to 30, 60, 90. Everyone's just like, those are actionable timelines where you can get stuff done. You can be focused enough to have a singular goal and you can actually achieve it. So hearing the mind of a real life entrepreneur is super valuable. So I really appreciate those insights. And Tiff, I knew we'd be short on time today because we are both marketing junkies and we could talk about this stuff for days. But I'm going to ask you this question that we ask at the end of every, every episode, and that's the one takeaway. For listeners who inevitably will feel challenged about the way that they strategically view their marketing and their growth plans and their ability to go get more clients, you've put so much of that on show for us here today, also tapped into your mind as an entrepreneur. So what's that one takeaway? What's the one thing you hope everyone walks away from today's episode with? It doesn't matter if you can drive traffic to your website or, you know, phone calls to your phone, if what you say when they get there doesn't land. And so review what you're saying when they get to that landing spot and see if you can say less, right? This could be you uh, pitching to your significant other or a friend. It could be you reviewing your website copy. Find the places where you are qualifying where you are discrediting yourself and find a way to remove them. That way you're not creating blockers to get people to you. 
Yes, Tiff, I'll tell you what, 900 some odd episodes and we continue to hear incredible advice from guests like you that are unique and I think it is a really poignant challenge for all listeners, whether you're a entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, that's actionable advice from Tiff right there that we can all incorporate into our businesses. So Tiff, I know that listeners are gonna be excited to see your website. We've talked about it quite a bit during today's episode, but I'm also just gonna toot your horn a little bit because you practice what you preach and it's on full display. When you talked about launching your own ad campaigns, I always love that notion of the cobbler's son has no shoes. You are a shining example of the fact that the cobbler's son does indeed have shoes and you are out there mastering your messaging. I love the way that you say less on your website and it's so abundantly clear what you do, who you serve and how you serve them. So drop those links on us. Where should listeners go from here? Uh, Check it out. It's novermarketing.com. Yes. And listeners, you already know the drill. We're making it as easy as possible for you to find a link to Tiff's business website at novermarketing.com. That's N-O-V-E-R marketing.com. You can find that link down below wherever it is that you're tuning into today's episode and just click right on through. We're also linking to Tiff's personal LinkedIn in the show notes. So if you want to reach out to her, have a marketing conversation with her, just thank her for sharing her insights. Do not be shy because most podcast listeners are. Take it from me as someone who interacts with so many of you. Don't be shy. Tiff, on behalf of myself and all the listeners worldwide, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me, Brian.